I do want to say thanks to Jake for speaking for me the other weekend. I enjoyed that. I did get a chance to listen to it finally, and, and it was good. It was really good. So I appreciate that. Um, it's something I have to learn to do is take a weekend once in a while. Um, so we're going to work at that. I feel completely underdressed this morning. I don't usually wear, I'm going to hide behind a pulpit so I don't blind you with my legs this morning, but <laughs> I just figured it would be easier with what we had going on today and getting from here to there, one less thing to worry about today, but I'll tell you what, it feels weird. Not that there is a dress code, but I'm not, I'm just not used to it, so we're going to hide behind this box this morning. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 5 today. Um, we're just going to do verses 1 to 12 this morning. Um, and we won't even get all the way through that. But uh, I've been feeling called to, to go to this Sermon on the Mount. And, and I don't know as if I've ever done that. Um, I don't think I've ever worked through that uh, any time since I've started preaching. And I, I kept feeling called to that. And the more I read on it and I, I got looking at commentaries and different things on it and... It was interesting how, even when Jesus taught this, how radical it seemed. And uh, I'll be curious to see if you think the same. Um, I certainly did. When you compare it to the ways of the world and, and, and the way so many are being taught and raised today, and we look at Jesus' criteria here, or his teachings here, and it is pretty radical. But it's from the mouth of, of Jesus. So... Not radical in the sense that, wow, we can't do that. More in the sense that, ooh, maybe we should be doing that. Um, so think about that as we go through. It's going to, like I said, it's going to be a little while before we get through that. But we're going to dive into it today. So let's start in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. This is out of the NIV this morning. Now Jesus saw the crowds. He went up to the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kind of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's have a word of prayer this morning. Father, this morning I'm excited to, to, to study the words of Jesus. Lord, we know, we know Scripture is inspired, Lord, but there's something about those red letters. Father, so I am excited. Lord, I pray that you'll be in our hearts. Lord, that, that any conviction that is necessary will fall upon us, Lord. Any, any confidence that needs to be instilled will also take place, Lord. Sometimes we, we fail to be confident in your grace and in your mercy and in the power that is within us, Lord. So help us in that today, Lord. Be with us as we get into your word, as we study, Lord. Help me to speak boldly and clearly for you. Help each one here, Lord, to, to apply, Lord, and to take it with us. Lord, these are life teachings for us. And we thank you for that this morning. Be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as I said, I was feeling called to, to get to this study. And, and as I shared last week, my, my goal in my teaching is going to continue to be to stick to the gospel accounts as much as possible, what was given to us in the Word of God. Because that's, that's where we're supposed to go and, and to let the Word do the work as it's intended to do. I've shared with you this before and I, I got the chance to speak to a missionary. He, he'd been in the field for, oh, 15 plus years. And, and we were at a table and some got debating really deep issues with him back and forth. 
And we asked him what it was like. I, I can't remember the, the country he was in, but it was, you know, the third world country, very poor. We're like, where did you, where did you preach out of? Where, where did you spend your time? He said, I never left the four first books of the New Testament. The gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, that was our mission. To show people Jesus Christ. To get them to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To bring them salvation. They were, they were aware of that limited window that we truly have. Here, we, it's like time stands still here. Sometimes it doesn't seem as, as prudent or as important to us. But our window is just as short as everybody else's. We just have a few more distractions to keep us from realizing that. So, so that is my goal. And that's why I wanted to look at the words of Jesus this morning. What, what is Jesus' teachings? They've been changing lives for thousands of years. Ever since the first time he spoke them. It's no different today. The transforming power of the gospel is just as powerful today as it was when Jesus gave this sermon. It's just as powerful. And the new found faith of a believer, a believer who, who puts their faith in Christ, who trusts in him, there's no more radical change that can take place today. Yeah, we, we tend to notice when people, when people might fall or people might make a bad decision, but, but really that's nothing compared to the change that can take place through the power of Christ. So that's where I want our sights to be set on. The power of the gospel. The power of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're going to set our sights. So that we can, we can truly stand out from the crowd. Because there, there's no mistake about it. And you'll see as we read through this. To mirror Christ as we are called to do. It'll produce in you something that, that most have never seen. To, to co totally commit yourself to the teachings of Christ, to, to following them. And, and I'm not saying we're going to do it perfectly because none of us, none of us are. But to, to truly do that in every aspect of our lives, most of us here haven't seen that. It is that transforming. It is that awesome and that radical to see. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have met that person that's there. I wish I could say I was there. But I, I've met those that are and, and it, it blows your mind. To think how, how can that person be so calm? How can they have such a peace? And it, it is radical and it's rare. But we have, and you're going to see as we get through the, these teachings, we're gonna, we, we have everything we need to get there. But there's some choices we got to make along the way. So if it's radical we're looking for, we're certainly going to find it in the next few weeks. We're going to dive into this Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's one of Jesus' at least his lengthier teachings that are recorded. Teachings that baffled many. That, that caused some to say, that's impossible. Did you, you can't do that. To say it couldn't be done. But it's a teaching that shows the true character of God. The strict standards to which to which he holds us. Now don't let that, that last line scare you. That standard to which he holds us. Because they are strict standards. The Lord wants perfection. But he doesn't expect us to be able to, uh, to obtain that from our own ability. Instead, he actually promised us to help us in our attempt to honor him through obedience because he, know, he knows that we're human beings. He knows that on our own we are not capable of such things. But you know, it's, it's a good feeling to know that he promises to help. That he says, I'm going to be there every step of the way. And that's why he gives us his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness as well. Remember that this week as we work through the study. None are perfect. All are flawed. And if anyone claims to be following Christ perfectly, that's one who warrants watching because it's not possible. 
but with Christ we have that grace and that mercy so let's let's get into this this controversial this radical teaching in Matthew chapter 5 we're going to start in verse 3 blessed are the poor in the spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven I'm going to read a couple ahead blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth blessed you might be thinking, well, well, how am I blessed in these situations? As I, as I read through that list, and even if you keep going, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted. Blessed are you when you're insulted. How, how am I blessed in that? So, some commentaries that you read relate it to happiness. And, and, and that's tricky, that word happiness, because the world likes to use that a lot. A bunch of, they'll give you a big list of things to make you happy or a bunch of things you can do to make you happy or things you need to change to make you happy and, and, and we have to be careful because happiness is, temp, is a temporary emotion something that is fleeting and ultimately dependent upon what is going on in the moment and when that moment is over you can quickly end up with any number of emotions there's a lot of sin that can make you happy for a little while that can make you feel good for a little while. But then it's over. Jesus is talking about something more permanent here. They're, they're, these are characteristics of, of one that follows Christ. And the one who does, these characteristics of one who follows Christ, they will undoubtedly, un, undoubtedly inherit the kingdom of God and we are blessed eternally when we live them out it is because we have found Christ because he dwells in us that we can have an inner joy that we can be blessed we are blessed because we know Christ because we have him in us and that is permanent yes there's going to be highs and lows yes there's going to be really really hard struggles but that doesn't change the fact that we are blessed. It doesn't change our eternal destination. It doesn't change that mindset of, of you know what, I am, I am truly blessed. And the, we're going to see that as we go through these. So I want to work through them one by one. To give, to give a better understanding of the characteristics which Christ says... As followers in him, we are to strive for and to live out with his help. I fear that all too often the Beatitudes, as they call them, are read over too quickly. Almost glossed over in the scriptures. Blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed. It's, it's easy to just snap through it and not really think about what he's saying. Or what he's talking about. And, and I've done it. Everybody, we have those times where we're just reading to read. And we're not really, it's not sinking in. And that, that's, that's why today is good. Times of worship are good. That is why our Bible studies are important. And our small groups are just, just quiet time really breaking down the word. It should be rather sobering to cover these teachings. To go through them. For most of us, it should be a real eye-opener as to what we have been neglecting to pursue. And for those who don't know Christ, it, it may sound like downright nonsense, completely countercultural or, or radical in comparison to what the, how the world says we ought to live. So there could be a broad spectrum of emotions this morning. Regardless of which category you might find yourself in, it is indeed by God's design that you feel such things in regards to, to the scripture that we're reading this morning. After all, the, the scriptures are not meant just for pleasure reading, but for instructing, for rebuking, for, for convicting those who read it. And soon you will see those who follow Christ. There will be a great conviction. There will be an awareness. And hopefully an awareness of the direction in which we need to go. 
It's kind of, think of it as a compass. We might be kind of all over the map right now, but this, this will point us in the direction we need to be going. Now as we go through this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference some explanations given in a study resource by David Jeremiah. So I can't take credit for some of this, but we're going to start in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. Well, what does that even mean? And, and no, it's not a financial reference. He is referring to the humble. Those with destitute hearts that sense their spiritual need and seek after God, they have the advantage and a great joy of being able to cry out to God for help. Think about that this morning. Being able, the awareness to be able to cry out to God for help. There shouldn't be that helpless feeling that so many have, that, that, that pit. That some of you may be familiar with it. I just, there's nowhere to turn. There's nobody to go to. There's, there's nothing to help me. But the poor in spirit, we know that we have help to go to. We know that there's somebody to talk to. We know that there's somebody that dwells within us that we can go to. We know that we can cry out to God. When you think of humility today, what do you think of? Who do you think of? We asked the teens this morning, what, what, what would others say of you? What would be a characteristic of you that somebody else would give? And that, that's a hard thing to think about. It was got kind of quiet for a little while. When you think about that, like, well, what, what would they? What would someone say about me? Those we meet who we consider humble. They're ultra aware of their need for God's mercy. They probably seek after it more than they really need to. Not only do they realize their need for it. But they have joy because they know they have obtained it. That God himself listens to them. And has blessed them eternally because we know his promises. When thinking of Christ, humble is a term that easily thought of. Think now to your, to your own attitude, to, to characteristics which you display in your life. Better yet, how would, like I said, how would someone else describe you? Do you realize, as it said here, regardless of your current circumstances, Regardless, regardless of where you're at in life right now, as far as finances, as far as, as far as a marriage, as far as your health, that we are indeed blessed because of God's mercy and grace, because of his salvation, which we have. We are blessed because we have that awareness. Think about that. There are so many today who do not have an awareness of the Holy Spirit, who do not have an awareness of the promises of God. That is can bring despair. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 reads, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The study said, Blessed are the hurting, the one who weeps over pains of life, for the one who weeps over the pains of life can be confident of God's healing and comfort. The Greek word translated comforted is also used to describe the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In our sadness, the Holy Spirit will move us to joy. Now, don't think too, too small on this one. Blessed are those who mourn or, or blessed are the hurting. It's more than just the pain of, of missing a loved one. The pain of losing someone. There's more to it. And, and I've met people who, who fit this very well. He is referring to those who feel the, the sorrow and mourn for the troubles of this world. 
for those who weep over injustices that take place, over the souls that are lost and looking for salvation but have not found it. I know this is some of you because I know some of your hearts. That what you see going on around us, what you see in the world today troubles you. We mourn for the world. As we seek after Christ, as we strive to mirror him, we become more and more aware of what is going on around us. You will find yourselves mourning over senseless violence, over persecution of the innocent, over, over grave injustices that take place every day. You are feeling and seeing and hearing as Christ. But you are still blessed. Yes, we mourn. Yes, things might make us upset. But we are blessed because, because we can find comfort in the Spirit. As he brings us to the realization that, that those who know the Lord will be healed. That creation itself will be renewed and restored upon his say-so. Upon his return. We are blessed because we know this. Because we believe that it will happen. In him and through him we will find our joy. We will find that blessing. I would ask you as, as followers of Christ, when you look around at what you see going on, does it grieve you? Does it upset you to watch what's going on? Are you, are you mourning for the world? Now I realize there is a ton of emotions that come out when we look around. But the spirit that resides in you is one that is grieved. One that is troubled at what it sees. Christ was greatly grieved at the hearts of men and how, how they had turned from the Father. He's still grieved at those who have not come to him. Who, who, those who refuse to come to him. But he also had joy for each and every soul that was saved when they put their faith in him. Be aware of your feelings of your thoughts. Take, take them captive and compare them with what you know to be true about the character of Christ. Compare them to what you read even in the, just in the Beatitudes. Does, does, our, does our attitude and our actions and our words match what we're reading? If those are the blessed, where are we? Do we fit in that? We're supposed to. Take them captive and compare to the dead. That's why it's so important to be in the Word. So important to know the Word of God. Otherwise, we don't know where we're supposed to be. Otherwise, we don't know what we're supposed to be feeling. And that's what lets all this other stuff creep in. Mourn for those who have left us. Those and those who are spiritually in a dark place. Allow yourself to do this out of compassion for them. Not for contempt. From that will come a desire to see them each find salvation. The salvation that you know. See, that's the danger there. When we're not feeling compassion, when we're not, when we're not mourning for someone as, as a loss. Want, when we mourn somebody with a loss, it's because we want them back, right? Because we miss them. Not because, well, that guy's gone. I don't want to see him again. I hope he never gets saved. No, that's, that's not what it is. We have compassion. Christ has compassion on those he's met those the demon possessed those who were who were doing evil in the church the pharisees though he had compassion he was hard on them out of compassion because he's not wishing anybody to death anybody to an eternity in hell he has compassion so think about that when our feelings stir up. Because like I said, there's a lot of them that come to mind. It's not always compassion. It's not always mourning. And I'm guilty of that. It doesn't take much to read something and, and, and get boiling a little bit. But that's when we take that captive. And go back to what the teachings say. Where are we? That w Just try it. <laughs> I, I, it's hard. I, I have to do this 
all the time because there's so much out there because we're inundated with so much stuff we have to have that pause button that says wait a minute whether you know on social media or on the radio or on the news you know what we're hearing and what we're seeing and the first thing we want to do is pick up that phone and be like oh goodness I'm gonna share that or I'm gonna I'm gonna type something about this person or I'm pause Take that thought, Captain. Then why? What? What emotion is that? What feeling is that? What am I doing with it? Give the Lord a minute, and He'll put you in the right direction. He'll put you in the right frame of mind because the Spirit is in you. We have to take a minute and listen. There's been a lot of times I've had to hit delete or backspace or even, and, and it can be in regards to something, even something that makes you chuckle that probably shouldn't. It doesn't need to go any farther. It doesn't need think, is, is it oh there used to be a saying and I can't think of it. Shoot. Is it I, there was like is it helpful? There's like three or four things and I don't remember it but you know it was that little checklist before I pass this on is there anything good coming out of this? That's that pause button. But are we mourning? Are we finding compassion for those who need it? Are you sensing a pattern here as we go through the list? Are you seeing the trend that is that's completely opposite of the characteristics you'll find in our world leaders? And, and those we see in life who seem to have gotten ahead of everybody else or seem to have it all. I hope so as far as finding a pattern. I hope you're seeing that. That what we're reading here, the standard which Christ is laying down is quite a bit different than the worldly standard. In fact, I'm sure it'll, it'll make little sense to those who do not know Christ. Let's go ahead to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek. The world would tell you that to be meek is, is to be weak, is weakness. To be a coward, scared to take what is yours, because that's what we're all about today. Seize it, take what's yours. Weak is not the definition here. I read a note on this that said, the, a lot of those who followed Christ who came to hear him were disheartened at this. Because they were expecting, you know, Jesus the King, Jesus the one that we're going to come, we're going to take over everything, we're going to rule the world, everybody's going to bow to us. It's not what he's saying. And that, that, was, that was huge. That's why it was so radical, because that's what they wanted. They wanted revenge. We want to get back at all these people that have kept us down. That was not his teaching. As I said, weak is not the definition here. Did you know that both Jesus and Moses are described as meek? Neither of them would have been considered weak individuals at all, were they? Rather, they were harnessed. Think about that. Meekness is not weakness, but power under control. It implies a humble acceptance of one's lowly position before God. By trusting in him, the meek will inherit the blessing of God's fulfilled promises. One of those promises being that one day we will inherit the earth. Today, this is a true test for believers to be humble and meek. It goes against every fiber of our being. It goes against every current in society. It goes against all the cor cor cultural norms. Think about it. When in life are we taught that it's okay to be meek? That it takes a very humble person to allow ourselves to live a life like that. In our selfie, hashtag, self-promotion world that we're in, there's not room for humble and meek. It doesn't get mentioned. The hard part being that, that we cannot proclaim ourselves as humble. 
We cannot proclaim ourselves to be meek. It's a lifestyle. It's an everyday choice we make to surrender to the will of God through the leading of the Spirit. We could send this message all around the world. I mean, it is on the internet, but it's not going all over the world. We could send it to everybody. Everybody could read it. And a bunch of people, they'd be like, oh, with their phones, you know, hashtag, I'm humble. It's, that's not what it is. It is a choice, an everyday choice, a lifestyle. And, and we have to learn it. It's not, it's not an instant thing. It's something we have to work at. And that's where the self-awareness and the assessment with the scriptures, that's where that comes in. If we never know what we're supposed to be, how do we ever get there? We, we, uh, sadly, we are in a society that self-centered. It's true. Even if we aren't posting pictures, we're thinking to ourselves, why, why doesn't anybody notice how humble I am? Why doesn't anybody get that? I can, I can be meek if I need to be. You know, that, that's, the, that's where, where, what it turns into. But it's not a once in a while thing. It's a mindset, a lifestyle. It's not a financial or social status. You can find some of the meekest individuals among the richest people in the world. And you can find some of the most prideful and arrogant people among the poorest in the world. When we are willing to acknowledge our lowly position before God, the fact that we are undeserving of His mercy and grace, even though He's given it to us, then we can see His great power at work. Then we can see transformation. Then we will see the power of the Holy Spirit move in lives and in ways we cannot imagine. Some of the greatest leaders in history were those who knew that they were unworthy of the position that they had been placed in. Yet they also knew that they had been given that responsibility for a reason. Greatness had been thrust upon them for a purpose. And they also knew that for that purpose, they could lean on God and His leading. If they could do that, they would succeed because it was His will, not theirs. No matter what the outcome in this life, those who are counted among the meek will inherit the earth and the life to come. That is the great promise to be fulfilled. That though we are meek, though we are unworthy, we have received His grace and will be counted among those who walk with Him in eternity. What a wonderful sight to look forward to. When that is our focus, everything here doesn't really, really doesn't measure up. It doesn't matter so much anymore. So think about these things this week. As we, when we come back, we will continue through the Sermon on the Mount. We are in the days leading up to Christ's return. There is no one thing in our lives more important than following Him. Have we not yet come to that realization that, that things of this life are temporary and futile? The last six months should have taught us that. We who have committed to follow Christ, who have confessed faith in Him, have been saved for a special purpose. That purpose is to lead others to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ before it is too late. The way we do that is through living as Christ, following the examples that are given us to the best of our ability. Contrary to what some say, there's only one way to heaven. Only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, whom we love and serve. Let us have a, let's close in a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise you today. Father, that, that we have your word, that we have these instructions, that we have a mirror, Lord, to look at. Lord, let us be your shadow. 
let us step as you stepped. For you are in us. Lord, if we know you, you are in us. The two, the two being baptized today, Lord, we are praying for the filling of your Holy Spirit upon them this very day. That is exciting. As I said, there's, there's a lot going on, even in our little communities this morning, Lord, that you are taking part in. Because you are still here. And you are in each one here this morning, Lord. So we praise you for that. We thank you for it. Be with us today as we go from this place, Lord. As we come together as family, as friends, Lord. As followers of you. Bless our time together today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you would, please stand and... Join us in our last hymn, number 240, this morning. Um, if anybody would like prayer.